This is the Decoding Obesity Podcast, where we simplify, demystify, and decode obesity, helping you lose weight and feel great. So gear up for a fascinating journey through this ever-evolving field, and let's see what we find. And please remember that the thoughts and opinions on this podcast do not constitute medical advice. Don't forget to visit our website, www.decodingobesity.com, for show notes and more info. And now, here's your host of the Decoding Obesity Podcast, Dr. Avishkar Sabarwal. Hi, friend. This has been an amazing journey for me thus far. I hope you've been enjoying my podcast as well. If you haven't subscribed to my podcast yet, hit the subscribe button to get notified of the latest episodes. As you probably know, I've started the Decoding Obesity community, and I would love to have you there. You can head to www.decodingobesity.com forward slash Facebook to join, or you can join from the form in the show notes. I would love to see you there to continue this conversation. Well, it's time for another amazing guest and another amazing life story. Graham Curry is from Perth, Australia. He actually contacted me over Instagram, and when I heard his story, I knew that I had to have him on my show. Graham has been practicing intermittent fasting, which has transformed his life completely. And believe it or not, he has lost 132 pounds. Isn't that amazing? That is the very reason I have him here so that he can inspire you and you can understand how he found success. He is also the host of a very popular podcast, The Fasting Highway, and he's also written a book by the same name, The Fasting Highway. I myself have tried intermittent fasting and I think it is a great tool to have in your repertoire. Let's learn more about him. Welcome, Graham. Oh, thanks so much, uh, Doctor, and it's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, 132 pounds, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's been quite the journey. Yeah, it's been very transformational in mind, body, and soul. Yeah, so, you know, Graham, this is the question that I usually ask my guests when they come on my show. When did you really realize that your weight was an issue for you? What was that moment? I guess I could go back to when I was 14 years old. I'm 58 now, and I overheard a conversation between my mother and father, and mum said to dad that Graham's getting really fat. And it wasn't something I really thought about until then, and it really cut me quite deeply, and I I sort of went into a bit of a tailspin after that. And then um, through my school years, I just started getting more obese as the years rolled on, and and then I, I got to the point where my mother and father bought a convenience store. And so when they bought that convenience store, that was a slippery slope because I spent three years of my life basically in a storeroom after school devouring all the the wrong things, Coca-Cola, chips, lollies, you name it. So that added to that weight. And then once I left school, I started working and then around 19, I got rheumatic fever and I got quite crook. And so I lost an immense amount of weight. And so basically, I went from a very obese sort of teenager to a sort of normal looking teenager. And and life sort of changed for me a bit. I had some great years and I was accepted. And it was the first time I really noticed that how obese people get treated so differently on their appearance. And so roll the clock forward into my 20s. I had quite a a lot of partying as we do when we're in our 20s. And then I got married in my (laughs) 30s and my weight sort of increased after that and then sort of my life sort of wasn't was happy, but I wasn't really happy in my life. And things like depression crept in, anxiety. I developed a lot of phobias, but really I just was abusive with food over those years. And it, it really got up to a stage where my weight sort of peaked at about a hundred and sort of, you know, sixty odd kilos or whatever it was, and you know, in three hundred and fifty seven pounds. And then I decided that one day I just had to break the cycle of it and that was it. Wow. So what do you think caused all of this? Was it mostly emotional eating or what exactly was it that caused you to really gain all of that weight? Oh, I just think developing the addictions to sugar, fast food, all the wrong foods. The more I ate of it, the sort of, you know, the more addicted I got to it. I just had no control really over it. And sort of just not being happy, I think it was a lot of emotional eating as well. And I think that's sort of the more weight that I gained and the more obese that I got. And I think when you talk to a lot of obese people, they probably say that you get to that tipping point where you just think, 
okay, I'm obese. I'm never going to be anything else but obese. The mountain seems too high to climb and you never think you're going to get out of obesity. And I think we all go through that as obese people. And it wasn't till that stage where I had that catalyst moment where I just thought enough's enough. I'm going to do something about it. But unfortunately, I spent all my adult life as an obese person and I just wish I'd taken stock of that a bit earlier in my life. And I think we all have that regret, but there is a point where you get so obese, you just think that you, you can't do anything about it. No, I hear you. You know, this leads me to the next question that I have is what changed in you that caused you to kind of make that decision that this was it and you needed to do something now? And how did your mindset change then? Yeah, I think we all have that catalyst moment. A lot of people I talk to, it might be a photograph or something like that, that they see themselves or a reflection. For me, it was getting onto an aircraft, January the 1st, 2018, seat 44G, I'll never forget it. And I sat next to my wife and that was really at the peak of my weight. And I just felt so terrible being on an economy sort of section on a plane and I just didn't fit in. I couldn't do up the seat belt. I was taking up half of my wife's seat. I felt terrible after a Christmas week of just binging on food and alcohol and everything else. I seriously felt like I was going to explode on that plane. And I looked at my wife and I thought, I love this woman so much. I cannot die on and leave her. And because of my obesity, I need to do something about it. So it was about a four-hour flight. And I guess that was the first time I really fasted of any type because it was the only type I've ever been on the aircraft where I didn't need everything in sight. And I had a really good think about it. And that was a catalyst moment. I got off the other end and I don't know what it was. I was just laser focused that I wanted to do something about it. And so that was the beginning of my journey in earnest when I really made that decision. This is it. I'm going to take my health back. So how did you zero in on intermittent fasting? Did you try anything else before that? And then you thought, well, let's try this. This is the new kid on the block. Or how did you get to this? Yeah, look, how I got to it was after I got off that plane, my first thing was I needed to find out about my sugar addictions. And I knew I was addicted to sugar. There was no no question about that. Fast food, I mean, I was spending three, four times a day going through a fast food drive through eating all the wrong foods. And I just had no off button, no control. So the first thing I did was I stopped that cold turkey. And I thought about it and I thought the only way There's no use me trying to reduce sugar. There's no use me trying to reduce my trips to the fast food store. I just need to stop. And so stopping the fast food trips was easier than the sugar addiction. And so basically, I went through everything in our house, all our pantry. I looked at what content sugar was in food. I learned how to do that. I learned how to read nutrition labels. I spent nearly four hours in the supermarket one day just looking at labels and working out how many teaspoons of sugar were in everything. And that was my first step. I had to break that. And I went through a very, very bad withdrawal. When I say bad, it was horrific. It was like three weeks of hell for me, really, just withdrawing from all that type of food. Even included two days in bed with a doona over my head, just trying to break these chains of addiction that I had. And I knew I had to do it, and I had to fight through it. And I I had all the classic things that I've never been a person that's taken drugs, and I don't know what drug withdrawal's like. But I can imagine it's a similar thing. I just had all the classic, you know, the voices saying, you know, go down and get some fast food, go and have some biscuits, go and eat some chocolate. You know, it was just tearing away at my mind. But I managed to get through that. And after the three or four weeks, it became easier. And then one day I was just Googling on the internet, actually, and I found intermittent fasting and one meal a day lifestyle. And at first I thought, who only eats one meal a day? That sounds like nuts. That's crazy. No one does that. I mean, I'm a guy that eats 47 meals a day, or used to. And then I thought, you know what, this sounds pretty simple. All you've got to do is fast for a period of time. You have your meal in an eating window. And it's not necessarily what you're eating, it's when you're eating. And I thought, I'm going to give this a go. And I really didn't sort of think about it too much. And the next day, I started. So I went straight into what's called a 23-in-1 protocol. So 23 hours of fasting in a one-hour period of where I'd have my meal. So with the OMAD one meal a day, the sort of what I did right from the, the outset was the restaurant style where I'd have an entree or a snack to open. So around five o'clock each day, that's what I'd do. And then I would have my main meal. 
And then if I felt like it, I'd have some type of dessert. But by that stage, I'd got over the sugar and everything. So it was usually some nice berries or maybe a little bit of yogurt or something. But nothing sort of too sort of like chocolate cake or biscuits or anything like that. And I usually closed my window with a coffee and I sort of ate till I was full and satisfied. And that was it. And that's that's how I started. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about addiction. Actually, I myself had quit sugar at some point in time. And it was difficult initially. And once you get over that hump, you really don't have that craving for sugar. It is really addictive. And I mean, ever since then, my cravings for sugar have drastically gone down. Like, I don't crave sweet stuff as I used to before I had done all of this. And listeners, I actually did an episode on uh, hyperpalatable foods and also on food addiction. So if you want to listen to that episode on food addiction, that's episode number 33. So you can go to www.decodingobesity.com forward slash EP33 to listen to that episode on food addiction. Food does have a very profound effect on us and certain substances in food can actually be addictive, just like sugar, fats, and high salt content, hyperpalatable foods. They're fairly addictive. And it can be difficult to quit. And I mean, kudos to you that you were able to do that. I know it can be very, very difficult for people to do this. So, Graham, what regimen do you follow now? I mean, you mentioned 23-1. Was it difficult for you to start the 23-1? How did you manage that? And how did you land upon the 23-1? Because there are so many other regimens available. There is. And I looked through them all and I thought, well, it suited my lifestyle because I worked and I got home around 4 30 And I thought, well, that suits me. I can go to work, not think about it. And by that stage, I'd already got over the sugar and sort of fast food withdrawals. I was coming out of that. And I always say to people, if you have an addiction to something like sugar or fast food or whatever it may be, then maybe you want to think about trying to treat that first before you start intermittent fasting. Because the problem is, if you still have those addictions and you intermittent fast, you'll still carry that into that sort of eating window. And you might tend to binge on that type of food, which really defeats the purpose of fasting and yeah. you know eating a, what we call a window-worthy meal. So yeah, I was already through that. So the 23 and 1 just suited me and suited my life. So And that's when I could eat with my wife too, around between 5 and 6 o'clock. And I thought, well, that's a great sort of protocol for me. And so that's how I started. And basically, I did that for 15 months until I lost 132 pounds. In the first eight months doing 23 and 1, I lost 100 pounds, and then I had a bit of a weight loss plateau, or what we call a weight loss stall, which is part and parcel. I mean, there's three certainties in life. There's death, taxes, and a weight loss stall, if you're on a weight (laughs) loss journey, and that's that's true. (laughs) So I hit this weight loss stall, and I thought, right, what am I going to do? So I trusted the process, and I continued on because I was feeling great. I didn't really change much at all. I might have added a little bit of exercise because summer came and I was swimming more, And then the weight started moving again, and I finally got to my goal weight because I'm six foot five tall, so I'm quite a tall guy. And I mean, I got to about 220 or 100 kilos, and I thought, okay, that's pretty much enough for a six foot five man. I was looking pretty lean by then, and I thought, okay, that's where I want to stay. And then I turned to, well, how am I going to keep the weight off now? Because as we know, a lot of obese people that lose an immense amount of weight over 90% of them will, will probably just about regain some of it, if not all of it, and maybe yeah. some more. So I was really conscious yeah. about that. So what I did was to change after I got to the maintenance phase, I switched to what's called a 22 and 2. So that's 22 hours of fasting and a two-hour eating window. So I just doubled that time. But really, I was probably only eating the same anyway. I just had a different time frame where I could do it. And then on the weekends, I started doing 16 and 8. And what that did was it allowed me to open up my social life a little bit more. And so I could go down and have a lovely brunch with my wife in a cafe around 1 o'clock in the afternoon and that sort of thing. And then I did what's called TMAD, which is two meals a day on the weekends. So that's basically how I've been maintaining my weight coming up two years now. And I try to keep it in around a two to four pound range. And so far, that regime has been working very, very well for me. 
Yeah, that's great. I mean, intermittent fasting itself can be very, very powerful. I've tried it and I think it worked great when I did it. Unfortunately, my schedule changed and you, you have to have a kind of similar routine to have uh, that consistent fasting window. And sometimes it can be very tricky. But what is your strategy in terms of opening your fast? How do you open your fast? Yes, um, I think that's important too. For me personally, when I was losing the weight, I was pretty consistent in what I did because it was working. So I'd normally open my eating window around five o'clock in the afternoon and I'd have, say, something like cheese, crackers, tomato. I might have a little bit of cold meat, something like that, and I might have a coffee with cream. So that's generally most days how I would open my eating window. And then I'd sort of sit and wait for a while and inside that hour, and then I'd probably take on my main meal of the day. Similar to what we talked about before, the restaurant style, exactly what you do at a restaurant. You'd have an entree, wait for a bit, your main would come. And then if I felt like a dessert of some type, then I'd have something. If I didn't, I'd just leave it. But I got to that point with the appetite correction that we talk about, where I just almost got that automatic signal that told me when my body had had enough and I was sustained for the day and I was satisfied. And I think that's important for people that just because you might have a one hour or two hour or three hour eating window, that doesn't mean that you sit there and eat for the whole hour or the whole two hours or the whole three hours. It's important to eat to your body satisfied and sustained and then maybe stop. Otherwise, you're going to overeat and then you're going to feel not so great. And that's how people, I think, don't get the results that they're looking for. Yeah, and I think the other thing is to pace yourself when you're open, uh, you know, in your eating window. If you eat too fast, again, you can eat too much. And then that also is not comfortable, especially if you're going to be doing one meal a day and that's going to be around dinner time because after that, if you're going to be sleeping, you're going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I think the important thing is that you, if you do t- tend to binge in your eating window then sometimes when you open, you have that sort of higher fats. and That helps with not, you sort of feel a bit satisfied right from the start, even though you've only just eaten a small entree. Something like avocado, yeah. for instance, that always makes me feel like I've, you know, I've had something reasonable to eat and I feel that I don't really need a lot. But it's important to eat enough to make sure you get those nutrients in and all that sort of thing and make sure your body is sustained. And I think you learn to do that. And you learn to listen to your body and and you just know when you've had enough. So that's important to not overeat in that eating window. And I think when I hear people struggling with intermittent fasting, the first thing I say to them is, how long do you eat in a two-hour eating window? And they say, two hours. I eat for two hours. And I say, well, why don't you just stop when you're full? Because I've got a two-hour window. So there's a correlation there where you have to sort of just eat to your satisfied. Yeah, that's true. So, Graham, when you started this intermittent fasting, didn't you have, I mean, there's this whole concept of people feeling that they're going to be starving themselves when they're fasting. Did you have that inhibition when you started? And how did you learn more about all of this? No, I didn't really. I sort of adapted to the fasting pretty easily. I I didn't find it hard because I just keep myself busy during the day. And I knew between five and six, that was when I was going to eat. And you know, I used to spend some time thinking about, oh, you know, what am I going to have tonight and what am I going to have tomorrow and all that sort of thing. And, and that sort of kept me going. And as that developed, I learned more about intermittent fasting. I read a lot about it. I read a few studies, that sort of thing. And to be honest with you, I like the science of intermittent fasting, but it, for me, it's been about an experiment of one, living the journey, actually going from yeah. an obese man to a normal weight. That has been my experiment. And I've tweaked things along the way to help me. But it's also important to know the science of what's happening. So I've read papers by through the New England Journal of Medicine that you may know of with um, Dr. Mark Matson, the 2019 study, or the he sort of was a compilation of studies that he put out a summary of, which I found really fascinating. Um, Obviously read Dr. Jason Fung's work with the obesity code and I've watched so many videos with Jason Fung, I think I almost know him personally. But it's great to sort of make that learning and talking to other obese people and learning about their struggles has been great too. And you see real correlations in an obese person's journey. And I think when somebody that's obese reads about or hears about someone else's journey, they just start shaking their head agreeing because they find so many things that resonate with them. 
Yeah, that's important. Now, the other thing that I want to ask you, Graham, is what did you do about your weight plateau? Did you change anything in your strategy other than just increasing the exercise and you know going into that maintenance phase? Or did you do something else to kind of break that plateau? No, I didn't really. I just sort of trusted the process. And at that stage, I was only eight months in to sort of my journey. And I thought, well, whatever I'm doing has been working. And you know, obviously, you, I think your body gets to that point where you've released an immense amount of weight. And there has to be a, a sort of a rest period, if you like, or somewhere where your body's just saying, okay, we're just going to get used to this maybe. I don't know. You might know more about this than me, obviously. But for me, I just felt like it's settled here for a minute. I'm just going to trust the process, do what I'm doing. I did increase the exercise a bit. And one thing I will say, when I lost that 100 pounds initially, I wasn't really doing a lot of exercise because for me, the focus was on food and I had to rewire my thought process and my mindset as to how I was going to change the way I ate, how I was going to gravitate towards more window-worthy type food, higher quality food. And I had to learn how to shop for that. And so one of the things I'd go to the supermarket or the big box store, and I learned that I, I shopped around the perimeter of the store. And that really, really helped me. And for anybody that's trying to cut down on sugar or carbohydrates and just shopping around the outside and going to the fruit and veg section, the meat section, the dairy section. I found that sort of naturally cut that down by a lot. So yeah, that was some of the things that I did along the way. But with exercise, when I got all the weight off, I started exercising more. When I say all the weight to that 100 pound point. And then I started walking more. I started swimming. I started rowing. And because I could, when I was obese, exercise was a drag and I didn't want to do it. I just felt like I didn't want to go down the gym when I was, you know, a 160 kilo guy. I didn't want to be the center of people's attention for all the wrong reason. I'd be the guy that would be struggling. So I didn't want to do that. And then when I started feeling much better and I lost a lot of weight, I was able to go for longer walks. I was able to take up swimming. I mean, swimming was a big thing for me. I couldn't swim to save my life because I was too obese. And then once I got the weight off, I took some adult lessons. I learned to swim. The first day I went there, I couldn't swim half a length of an Olympic pool. In six months, I could swim 30 laps of an Olympic pool. And that's the difference. Wow. One day I was out walking, really funny actually, a bit of a Forrest Gump story. I was walking and I felt so great, I broke out into a bit of a jog. And for me, that freedom of just being able to run and I've never been able to run most of my life until then because I was so heavy. And I just felt so great. And it was almost like that feeling of Forrest Gump when that scene where the calipers breaks off his legs and he starts running. And yeah. I just kept running. And I remember having tears running down my face. And it was a very emotional moment that I discovered without this weight. And that was a really driver for me because afterwards I thought about it and I thought, I can do anything now without this weight. And that was a real key point in the whole journey. Wow. Yeah. That must have been very profound. I mean, I can only imagine what it would have felt like. You know, I I did do an episode on weight plateau also that we were talking about. And I think it's very important to understand that concept because you will definitely hit one point where your weight is going to kind of stall. And it's important to recognize that at the outset when you're trying to lose the weight because the trajectory of the weight loss is not going to remain the same through your journey of weight loss after a while it kind of slows down. And that's when your body's trying to prevent you from losing further weight. And that's just a natural process that the body is going through. So that's something very, very important to understand. Graham, before we close, I have to ask you this so that people who are just about to start or who are thinking about intermittent fasting, what is the next step for them? What advice would you give them in regards to starting the intermittent fasting, especially with regards to how to prepare for the fast? Oh, look, I think just start slow and stay in your comfort zone. And most people I know, they start with the 16 and 8. So basically, that's just skipping breakfast and then going through to your lunch period. So you've had that sleep period. You've had that morning period. So that's a 16 and 8. So that's the first thing. Start slow. Don't try and do big, long fast or extended fast when you first start because they're very hard to do when you're trying to adapt to fasting. Also about your mindset. Try to visualize what's life going to be like for me without this weight? 
What can I do? What are some of the things that have restricted me in my life? And write them down and visualize them. And then that gives you a bit of motivation to start. And then when you're in your eating window, sort of start thinking about what I want to do here. What's the purpose? Do I want to sort of eat more healthy than what I have been? Or did I just want to give myself an excuse because I'm intermittent fasting to eat everything and anything, including all the junk under the sun? So that's the first thing you've got to think about. So keep that window worthy. The clean fast for me is key. And for me personally, it's the foundation on fasting for me. So by the clean fast, I mean black tea, black coffee, water, plain sparkling water, or plain green tea, no flavors. And that clean fast just gives you all the sort of added benefits of the whole process And if you're going to cut corners by having, I know some people do that, but if you just give that clean fast a chance at the start, and that will put you in great stead. And because it all depends too on how long do you want to do this for? Is it going to be a lifestyle change? So there's many, many things, but mindset is most important and also learning to love yourself first. And by that, I don't mean in an egotistical way. I mean in a way that you have that love for yourself where you stop self-loathing, you stop talking about yourself in a negative way. Start talking about yourself in a more positive way and start talking to yourself in positive affirmations every morning when you wake up and it will set you up much better for the day. So it's so important mindset in this whole journey. And for me, the mental part of intermittent fasting is probably 95% of the whole thing. So just start slow, clean fast, make your window worthy, And trust the process and have patience. Give it at least 6 to 12 months before you can make a true evaluation of the health benefits, which is number one. That's important to note. I mean, you're listening to me that lost 132 pounds, a lot of weight. But for me, the health benefits of intermittent fasting far outweigh the weight loss. No, yeah, that's absolutely true. That's very well said, Graham. And actually, something that you mentioned that I kind of mentioned also to my listeners is the fact that it's you've been given this body so it's not about blaming yourself when you're starting anything but it's about taking responsibility for this body and what i mean by that is you have to be responsible for the physical body that you've been given and once you take start taking that responsibility and just leave the blame away then you kind of start breaking these walls down about whose fault it is that you're suffering from disease or not suffering from disease and now you're moving forward and taking the responsibility of finding ways to help finding ways to get the cure or get the help you need for fighting this disease. And the other thing that I mentioned with specifically with regards to fasting is that whenever you're fasting, I think it's very, very critical and very crucial to have something ready when you're about to break your fast so that you're not grabbing that next chocolate bar or that next piece of candy when you're ready to break your fast. Oh, for sure. And I think that's Preparation is everything, no matter what you do in life. And I think if you prepare something that's lovely and take your time and make that plate look great. I mean, when I was obese, I just used to throw food on a plate. There was no presentation. But now I make it sort of part of my day. I make sure that I take my time. I present my food nicely. There's lots of color on there. And then, you know, groups that you sort of see with intermittent fasting, you see a lot of people posting pictures of what they might break their fast with just lovely presentation and that's a really key think about it you know sort of be proud of what you've done and it's really improved my cooking skills a lot too intermittent fasting i've got to say just taking my time and learning how to prepare food how to make it fresh you know nice lovely salads I, i started growing a lot of salads so yeah there's many many ways you can make your day much better with intermittent fasting yeah that's great well this has been a great episode Listeners, I'm looking for more inspiring and fun stories like this one. This was really amazing. I mean, what, Graham, what you've done, it's fascinating. So if any one of you who's listening, if you have a story to share with me, please email me at host at decodingobesity.com. And I want to remind you all that you're not alone in this weight loss journey. You have Graham here, and we have so many other people who've had this weight loss. And sometimes this can be a very lonely place to be in. So that's why I've created this Decoding Obesity community so that you can find some others who are on the same path, get the support you need. Sometimes you need a shoulder to put your head on when you're not succeeding. So head on over to www.decodingobesity.com forward slash Facebook to join the Decoding Obesity community. 
Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much, Graham, for sharing your story. And thank you, everyone, for listening in. I'll see you all next time. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Decoding Obesity Podcast. Please remember, the information in this podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely of the host and his guests and do not constitute medical advice. Views and opinions on this show do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of any organization. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening in. Don't forget to visit our website, www.decodingobesity.com, for show notes and more info. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on your preferred podcast listening platform. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.